Today's video is about a scammer that tried to target me in order to hijack my machine, I suspect probably with the intention of taking control of my YouTube channel. I thought it might be useful if we take a look at what happened and how I determined it was a scam. I received an email, supposedly from Nikon, offering me a sponsored review opportunity. Now I get quite a few things like this, some of which are actually completely genuine, but this one is 100% fake. How do I know that? Well, there are a lot of little tells, but because of the targeted nature of this scam, I have to consider the possibility that the scammer might eventually watch this video about it. Therefore, I'm only going to try to point out those factors which I think the scammer can't control and improve. There are plenty more to be found, and they are plain as day, but I'm not going to point them out in case it helps the scammer improve his game. So the email originates from a domain called nikon-corp.com, which is an immediate kind of yellow alert. Of course, it's not unheard of for companies to use an additional domain name for marketing or other purposes, which is why it's not a red alert, but it's still something to arouse caution. Looking at the domain info for Nikon-Corp, it was registered via a low-cost web registration and hosting company called Hostinger, which seems to me like it might be a little bit below Nikon's market level. The domain was registered to an individual in India, which is in somewhat sharp contrast to Nikon's main domain, which is registered to Nikon in Tokyo. Again, there could be perfectly legitimate reasons for something like this, such as a big company farming out part of their promotional or marketing operation to an agency or some such. But again, this mismatch is another yellow alert. There are also a load of details that are wrong or suspicious in the email itself. As mentioned, I'm not going to point these out in detail, and if you want to comment that you can see them, please don't go into detail. The email itself says, hello, my name is Michael Taylor. We're now looking for partners to grow our brand on YouTube, and we invite you to become a Nikon YouTube partner. A little bit of information about us. And then there's a little bit of an explanatory blurb about who Nikon are for all those people in the world who haven't heard of Nikon. Let us know if this offer is of interest to you, and we will send you details of cooperation. Best regards, Michael Taylor. So what else? A really quick Google of the three words Nikon YouTuber scam brings up results warning people about fake representatives from Nikon, and the text of the release from Nikon confirms my suspicion about the whole business with the domain name. So without going any further, we've now established that this is definitely a scam. I hope we're all agreed that this is something that, whilst it's not perhaps glaringly obvious, it was completely possible for us to arrive at this conclusion that this is a scam without clicking on any links or opening any attachments. There weren't any, but what I'm talking about is the principle of deciding that something is a scam by the earliest evidence and the safest method. Anyway, having determined that this is a scam, I thought it might be interesting to investigate what kind of scam. So first, I opened up the Nikon-Corp website, and since this would be the potential equivalent of clicking a suspicious link, I did that inside a disposable VM. But there's nothing exciting to see, except that the complete absence of any web content is another confirming factor that this isn't really Nikon. Next, I replied to the scammer to say, please do tell me more, it sounds interesting. The scammer replied, Thanks for your interest in our offer. We are pleased to offer you the following options for cooperation. 1. Creating a video review of our products. And in this case, they would supposedly send me a free item and a discount code for my viewers. Or 2. Insert a small promotional video at the beginning of your next video or place it as a separate video. So basically, make an advertisement for Nikon. Of course, this isn't Nikon. When the terms are agreed, we make a contract with you and send an advance payment for the video, 50%. We send the remaining 50% after the video is published on YouTube. We hope you will be satisfied with the terms and we look forward to hearing from you to continue our cooperation. So despite that we already know this is a scam, it does actually sound sort of official and proper, doesn't it? There are again some parts of that email that would have raised my suspicious eyebrow just a little bit, but anyway, I replied, I think a review of a product would fit my style better. Before I commit to doing this though, please may I see the promotional catalogue. Michael replied, I'm glad you chose option one. We would appreciate it if you could describe the Nikon product in your own words. We think your audience loves you and listens to you for your talent, eloquence, charm and creativity. Oh, stop it. We don't demand serious and complicated things with a bunch of standards and rules. We just want every blogger to present their audience the format they're used to seeing on your channel. If you're satisfied with our terms, then I will send you a catalogue for you to look at and make a decision. I'm waiting for your confirmation. I'm not going to point out in detail where this is suspicious, but this email is written in scammer language. I deal with a lot of scammers and it sort of jumps out to me. I decided not to agree to any terms, not that it would form any kind of legally enforceable contract. This is, after all, a scammer who's acting in bad faith. Anyway, I replied, please go ahead and send the catalogue through. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. The scammer replied with an email containing a PDF attachment. The other attachment's just an HTML version of the message. The email says, I hope our products will arouse your enthusiasm and we hope that this cooperation will be successful. 
We invite you to choose a product from our catalogue 2022. There are many tabs in the catalogue. You can browse through all of the products and choose the one that suits you best. More information you will find in the PDF I have attached to the letter. I look forward to hearing from you. OK, now there's no way I'm touching this attachment on any computer I care about. It's a PDF, and Adobe's record for security is not spotless. In the past, it has been possible to embed executable content in a PDF. So I fired up a disposable Linux VM in a machine that I use for this kind of purpose. The PDF just contained a bland-looking page of text with a link, and we're already way off the edge of the map for what is sane and normal for a legitimate company. If this was really Nikon, and there was really a catalogue of products they offer to people for promotional videos, there would most likely have just been a link in the email going straight to some pages hosted directly on Nikon's own website at their main domain. None of this link with a PDF with a password to download shenanigans. Because regardless of everything we've already seen, a link inside a PDF attached to an email is an immediate red alert. Scammers do this because it sometimes obscures the link from being detected as malicious by your email service or mail client. The link in the PDF goes to a zip archive file hosted at Mega Upload, which is hugely suspicious. I have to believe that Nikon would simply never do this. Now, I think this is probably the right point to say that whilst you'll hear a lot of people talk about using VMs to safely open potentially malicious links, there are still bad things that can happen here. That might sound impossible, but hear me out. Let's say you're a user of some online service. You have an account there, and when you sign in, you can do stuff, important stuff, like paying for things, running your business, managing sensitive data, or storing photographs of your cutlery, that sort of thing. Now, suppose that online service has a security flaw, a shortcoming in the technical design that makes it vulnerable to something called a cross-site request forgery attack. This type of attack forces a user to carry out unwanted actions on a website or service when they're already signed in and authenticated. So let's look at a couple of scenarios. If you click on a link that contains a cross-site request forgery, in very general terms, one of two different things will happen. Option one, if you've told your browser to remember your credentials and log you in automatically, the link opens the service and the CSRF attack goes straight to work immediately. Your valuable spoon photos are now available to the attacker. Option two, you haven't told your browser to remember your credentials because you are security conscious. In fact, you use complex passwords that you store in an encrypted password vault, and you've also set up multiple factor authentication. In this case, when you click on that CSRF link, what you probably see is a login screen, a completely genuine and authentic login screen for the website or service in question. Option two now splits into two choices. 2A, you back out without logging in. But what would make you do that? Remember, this looks like a genuine login dialogue, because it is a genuine login dialogue. And you click the link, so you're obviously intended to do something. But OK, you back out of the login screen for some reason and don't log in. In this case, you're safe. Nothing bad happens. Option 2B, you log into the completely genuine login screen with your genuine credentials, responding to the secondary authentication challenge as normal. In this case, once you've logged in and authenticated, the CSRF attack, the thing that got you here, is probably able to complete its objective and compromise your photos of silverware. And here's the point. Scenario 2B will happen just the same on any machine connected to the internet, regardless of whether it's your own machine, a private browser tab on a friend's machine, or indeed a browser inside of a virtual machine. In short, a virtual machine won't necessarily protect you from attack when the target of attack is not your machine, but is in fact your account. This is a lot of the reason that my emphasis in earlier videos has been about discovering as early as possible that something is a scam and stopping there. Anyway, back to the scam at hand which was not, as far as I can tell, a CSRF attack. The document also mentions a password to open the linked file. Again, massive, massive red flag on this one, because this is a tactic that attackers will often use to obscure the contents of the file from being scanned for malware by the hosting service or by your computer when you download it. Antivirus software won't be able to see the contents of a compressed file that's encrypted with a password. And so this zip file contains several files that, although they're named a bit like documents or videos, are actually screensaver files, that is, executable files for Windows. I'm sure Windows would give me a security prompt if I tried to open them there, but if I was uncautious enough to click past that, I'm fairly sure I'd be installing malware. I did extract one of these files and try scanning it with ClamAV on my Linux VM, but it didn't recognize any known malware in it. So this might be something that's very new. I did think about uploading it to a couple of different online malware scanning pages, but the file was too big. Possibly they made it that way on purpose. So not very certain exactly what it is. I am very, very certain, however, that this file is up to no good. Most likely a Trojan that would allow the scammer to control my machine or gain access to my data or install a keylogger to capture my credentials, or maybe just ransomware or something like that. 
So I'm not actually going to dig any deeper into what this was, because in real world terms, we're already way past the point where anyone with a job to do and not enough time in their day to do it should have decided this was a scam and stopped dealing with it. Hold that thought, we'll come back to it in a moment. So just to wrap up, I decided that rather than giving this scammer the pleasure of knowing that I was onto him, I instead replied to say, I've been thinking about this some more and I've decided I don't really wish to go ahead with the collaboration. I feel like perhaps paid product placements and sponsorships aren't such a good fit for me and my channel, which is incidentally pretty much the truth in all honesty. The scammer tried to bargain a bit, replying to say, if this format of cooperation does not suit you, then I suggest you make a video in which you received a Nikon camera as a gift and decided to share the emotions of the gift with your viewers. A few words about the gift. I hope this format will work for you. So basically lie to your viewers about where this supposed camera came from. I mean, there is no camera, it's only a scam, but it's interesting here to see the scammer try to appeal to dishonesty. I said, I'm not really sure what difference that would make, it would be a paid product placement either way, right? The scammer tried one more time to get me to install that malware, saying, thanks for your reply, we will send our product that you choose in our special promotional catalogue and you will give it to you as a gift for cooperation. I hope it works for you. I replied, thanks, but I'd prefer not to, and that was that. Anyway, that point I said I would come back to is this. With this scam, and being properly vigilant, I was as convinced as I ever needed to be that this was a scam before I saw the attachment, before I clicked the link, and before I visited the download site. In fact, before I even replied to the scammer. Investigating further was interesting, but not necessary in terms of day-to-day -day protection. I get a lot of people telling me I'm wrong to be trying to discourage folks from clicking on links and attachments in dodgy emails and that instead I should be teaching people how to investigate them by opening them in a VM or carefully scrutinising the URL. In fact, probably to a deeper level of investigation than you just watched me doing. And that's fine if your job is electronic security or if you have the spare time to tinker and investigate. But for a lot of people, I think it's just not necessary to go that far down the rabbit hole. And in reality, not everyone has the time and inclination to acquire the technical skills to do that and to keep those technical skills sharp and up to date in the face of constantly developing threats. And neither should they. By way of analogy, sharks can eat me and that would be bad for me. I don't need to train as a marine biologist and understand the feeding behaviours and bite strength and tooth arrangement and digestive systems of sharks in order to keep myself safe from being eaten by sharks. I just need to know what a shark looks like and avoid getting into the water with sharks and that will probably do the job just fine. The amount of effort it takes to determine that something is a scam can sometimes be quite small and that's perfectly okay, in fact it's more than okay, it's ideal. Once you've determined it's suspicious, the question of should I click this is already fully answered in the negative. There's no more time to be wasted, nothing more that needs doing, except of course to always continue to be on your guard for whatever is the next one. So in a nutshell, that is the approach I recommend. Maximum vigilance always, but where possible, minimum effort spent on things that can be easily determined to be suspicious. I hope this has been interesting, thanks for watching, stay safe from scams, and I hope to see you again soon.